So we looked at the introduction to Revelation last time and we looked at the map of the seven churches and this is what we are going to deal with today. We are going to deal with the seven churches though not in great detail because time is limited but just to remind us that the book of Revelation talks about the past which is chapter 1, the visions of God, chapters 2 and 3 what we are going to look at today, the visions of grace that is the present church age, then chapters 4 to 22 is the future, we break that into two, chapter 4 to chapter 20, the visions of government and then chapters 21 and 22, visions of glory, that's our ultimate end, that's our ultimate destiny. So having said that, I will jump ahead a little bit and uh, we ended last time, we looked at chapter 1 and we ended with this last time, that is Daniel's 70 weeks. And uh, at the end of it, now we are right here at the end of the church age over there and we know that the Lord is coming soon for various reasons, we will look at those reasons and then today we are looking at that church age between the Messiah's ascension and the rapture. So these seven churches symbolize seven ages of the history of the church. Some don't believe it but it's very clear from the scriptures. Then, God willing, the next two weeks, we will look at the tribulation, part of the tribulation, and then the millennial rule of Christ, and the end, the great white throne judgment, the new heavens, and the new earth. With that, the whole series will come to an end, and what a good way to complete it. So today, we will look at the church. So there are seven churches, we know, Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamum, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia and Laodicea and these were real actual seven cities and some of these cities still have the same name though some of them have been what shall I say uh, have been uh, you know changed into Turkish names but the original names are still used by people perhaps the closest we come to is uh, Laodicea in Greek which is Laodicea in English Philadelphia is a popular name and there are many cities around the world named after Philadelphia and uh, Philio means uh, love or brotherly love, Delphus is city, city of brotherly love and in fact after, out of all these ancient cities the least amount of ruins that are remaining is that of Philadelphia which is roughly about I would say about 10 times the size of this our church premises that's all. Everything else, they are preserved and Ephesus, as I told you, is a city that is uh, most well preserved, one of the best ancient cities. Now, we are going to go through each of these cities or the letters to each of these cities. Again, I can't go into all the details because we have only about 30 minutes for this sermon. So, almost all the letters commence with a commendation, something positive. Then followed by a complaint and then end with a call to correction. Now that also teaches us a practical principle. Paul also does the same thing in his letters. Before you point out a weakness to somebody, you also first talk about the good things about that person or something good that person has done. Many a time we are so critical that we only find fault with people. So this is something that we practice in the private sector. If you have done your uh, annual evaluation or appraisal of your staff, you first start off with the good things that they have done. And then we go on to areas where they need correction. Of course, nowadays we don't call it to be politically correct. We don't call it uh, your weak areas. We say areas for improvement. It's like Sri Lanka is no more a developing country, but uh, so we are no longer an underdeveloped country, but we are a developing country. Same thing, but you put a positive spin on it. Instead of saying, telling somebody, you know, you are ugly, saying that you need plastic surgery, something like that. I know it's a bad example, but that's how it goes. So, first start with a commendation, something good, and a complaint. This is what's wrong with you. And then, this is what you need to do to correct yourself. So the, these three churches can be, oh, sorry, these seven churches can be studied in three ways. Firstly, 
these are literal churches which existed and these were their specific issues and problems and the Lord is addressing them. That is one way to look at it. Secondly, these rules are perennial, means almost all the churches have similar problems even in the 21st century and you can apply these rules to these churches so you can apply it to us as well. And finally, from a prophetic point of view, the most important thing is that each church actually represents a particular era of church history. And I'm sure you would have guessed it, we are now in the Laodicean age. We'll see why. Because if you look at the characteristics of these churches, you see that they represented some point in time of history. Of course, two of those churches were good people like us. <coughs> I mean, I am not sure, but were good people. They didn't have any complaints against them. Okay, let me try this out. What are the two churches? I'll give you a small clue. When people name their church, uh, say when you name your children, you won't call your son Judas, right? Or you won't call your daughter Jezebel. <coughs> Sorry, why? Because those are names of uh, villains, bad characters. In the same way, when you name a church, you will only give the names of good churches. So these two names are used by various churches to name themselves. What are the two churches? If you give one, you can't give the second one, I'll give a chance to somebody else. Two churches, there are no complaints against them. Good guys. One Philadelphia. Philadelphia. Other one? Jesus. No. no. Smyrna. Smyrna. Right. So why? There is a Philadelphia church in Kotehena here, as far as I know, and there's a Smyrna church in Novaria. So they have named them because they were well known. Please don't start a church and call yourself Ephesus or, or Pergamum, that's terrible, or Thyatira, that's terrible, right. But as I told you, remember, for those who are new here, my neighbors had two dogs when we were small, Judas and Barabbas. So those were the names of the dogs. Both were terrible dogs. They used to try to bite us every time we went there. So name your dogs, but not your you know, children with those names. So same way, we give good names, Smyrna, Philadelphia. So, we are going to go through each of them. So, I mentioned this, second and the sixth, Smyrna and Philadelphia, no complaints or correction, only commendation. But they were good churches. Right. Now, to all the churches, there is a promise. To those who overcome, the Lord Jesus promises something glorious. Now, who are the overcomers? It is very clear. In 1 John chapter 5 we are told that he who believes that Jesus is the Christ or the Son of God is or the Messiah is the overcomer. Means every true believer will be an overcomer. Of course some believers do die I admit in a backslid, backslidden state but still overcomers are promised great rewards and great glory in the word of God. So that should motivate us to be overcomers to run the Christian race, the Christian life, to complete it, to run the race and finish it, and to fight the good fight, as Paul said. So let us be encouraged as the time is nearing, as the time of the Lord's coming is near, let us encourage one another and continue to grow in the faith. And the ideal thing would be to hear the Lord Jesus say, well done, you good and faithful servant. Nothing else matters. So that's very important. And remember, all these seven promises to the overcomers are not earthly promises. They are eternal rewards in the new Jerusalem, in the new heavens and the new earth. So, what, what is overcoming actually? Now, what does it really mean? Basically, overcoming temptations and tribulations in our life. Temptations are a plenty and they will be with us, around us, in us, above us, over us, everything, because temptations are always there. Oscar Wilde, the famous, well, uh, the Irish writer said, temptations, uh, sorry, uh, opportunities knock once, but temptation tries to break the door down. You know what that means. Opportunity will knock and if you are sleeping, it will go away, you have lost it. But temptation won't go away. It will try to break the door down and enter into your life. So when we overcome temptations, when we overcome here, tribulation means trials in our lives. 
God permits us to go through trials when we overcome, we are victorious, we are overcomers and the Lord will reward us. Remember the five crowns we often speak about. So uh, this is Ephesus, the first church. Now Ephesus is the only church to whom two apostles wrote letters. Firstly Paul and then John. Ephesus is the formal church. Chapter 2 verse 1, these are the words of him who holds the seven stars in his right hand and walks among the seven golden lampstands. Ephesus plays an important role in early Christianity. In fact, Paul's letter was addressed to the believers in Ephesus. Paul's two letters to Timothy were written when Timothy was a leader of the church in Ephesus. So Ephesus plays a very important role. Paul went there, John went there. In fact, the apostle John lived and finally died there and his tomb is there in Ephesus. So it is still identified and it's, uh, it's genuine and one of the few tombs that are, you know, I would say, genuinely identified by archaeologists. So you can still go and see that in Ephesus. So it was a lovely city, very wealthy, but this was their problem. Their biggest problem was this, that they had forsaken their first love. The love they had at first. Chapter 2 verse 4. Initially when they came to the Lord, they were full of the Lord. In fact, one of the best epistles in the New Testament is the epistle to the Ephesians. Remember the first three chapters talk about our heavenly relationship. It is all about the heavens. And the last three talk about our earthly relationships and how you apply when our vertical relationship is fine and our horizontal relationships become fine. And they were such a lovely church, full of fire for the Lord. What happened? By the end of the first century, the second generation of Christians had come in and the love that the first generation had, had cooled down. Now this is something we need to guard against. Never let that fire in the belly go out. And you need to keep praying to the Lord that he will keep that fire going. You know why? Anyone can backslide. I still remember in the early 1980s, I was a little boy and uh, there were lots, a few Christian leaders, young men who were coming up through the ranks. Some of them are still serving the Lord. One of course sadly met with an accident, he was knocked down by a train and he died. And there was another man, everyone said, this guy is going to be a, the next generation's greatest Christian leader in Sri Lanka. What happened? The fire died down. He, his way, the, how the devil tempted him was with money and position. He got promoted very fast in his organization and he was doing so well that he had no time for God. He gave up on God. His life went into an utter tailspin, that company collapsed, he lost all his wealth. Now, recently I met him at a wedding, he's just coming back, he had just started going back to church. What a tragedy. A man who could have influenced a whole generation is now nowhere. I'm sure none of you would have heard of him. So, it's very sad. Uh, the, uh, this is an actual incident, there was a man who, uh, if you are from Bethesda or near the Helen and Mary, you might remember Paul would have been too small. You remember Charlie Week? Okay, Charlie Week. Okay. Charlie Week was known as Two Hour Charlie because his sermons used to last for two hours. But amazing teacher, he gave us this illustration. He said, There was a man who was really on fire for the Lord. Then what happened was, he started doing well in his uh, worldly affairs. He had a business and the business started doing very well and he was flourishing. You know what happened? He didn't have time for God. He gave up on God. He was still a believer, he gave up on God. Eventually, years passed and he advanced in years and he was in his deathbed and he called for a man of God or a priest or a pastor to come and pray for him. So when somebody turned up and this is exactly what he said and I quote, he said, uh, he said, Dear Reverend, I have filled my pockets with the sands of the desert and I have lost my crown. I filled my pockets with the sands of the desert and I have lost my crown. What does it profit a man if he gains the whole world and yet loses his own soul? Eternal rewards are forever and they are glorious. 
They are not worth comparing to the benefits that we can get in this world. So that's what happened to Ephesus. They were like, they had become a very formal church. At the end of the era of the apostles, that Ephesian church represents for us the early church. In church history from AD 30 to AD 100, they lost that love they had for the Lord. In other words, they were reminded of the presence of God. So their, fun, their problem perhaps was the issue of fundamentalism. That is very sound, outwardly, doctrinally correct, very active, lots of activity, but notably lacking in love, most likely love for the Lord and love for one another. So remember, activity does not, is not a good measure of our spirituality. Then we go to the second church, Smyrna. Now Smyrna is one of those good ones. Now Smyrna had a problem. They went through utter suffering. In fact, if you take the 2000 years of church history, look at the uh, persecution that the church has gone through. You know, one must admit that church has always been persecuted, but the greatest amount of persecution was during the Smyrna age. That's why the Lord writes to them in verse 8 of chapter 2, these are the words of him who is the first and the last who died and came back to life. The Lord is telling them, endure persecution, do not worry even if it ends in death, because I died and now I live again. That means you too are sure of your, you can be sure of your resurrection, the great and final victory. So Smyrna is the persecuted church. AD 100 to AD 312. That's the time the Roman Empire really went after the body of Christ. And I have here, now, two verses there, chapter 2 verse 9, the Lord says, I know your sufferings or I know your afflictions. God identifies with our suffering. We have a high priest who understands the feelings of our infirmities. God became human. He understands what it is to be human. He understands our fears, our struggles, our disappointments. He understands our failures. A God who cannot suffer is a God who cannot love, a man of God said. So we have a God who loves us and who cares for us. And when you shed tears in darkness and no one else seems to be knowing it, God knows and he understands. So that's the promise to Smyrna. I know your afflictions. I know your sufferings. I am with you. And then he also says, verse 10, you will suffer persecution for 10 days. Now again, the book of uh, Revelation we saw is highly symbolic. Not 10 days. 10 days is not a long time. Even a quarantine when you come in from overseas is 14 days. So only 10 days of suffering? No. What it symbolizes there is historically proven. During that period, 100 to 312 AD, there were 10 distinct waves of persecution under 10 different Roman emperors. Now you see how prophecy gets fulfilled as we read history. I will tell you, I know for those of you who have studied uh, Greco-Roman history, this will mean something. For those of you who hated history, it may seem like rubbish, but I'm trying to prove a point. Ten afflictions. I'll tell you the emperor, the Roman emperor, plus the year he carried out this. Nero, 54 AD, Domitian, 81 AD. Domitian is the guy who sent John into exile to the island of Patmos, where he wrote this. Then uh, Trajan, AD 98, Adrian, AD 117. If you are hoping to have children, don't name them Adrian, bad emperor. Then Septimius Severus, AD 193, Maximin, AD 235, Decius, AD 249, Valerian, AD 254, and finally, uh, sorry, uh, then Aurelian, AD 270, and the final one was Diocletian, AD 284. And this outbreak, almost each of these outbreaks lasted, interestingly, 10 years. See how accurate God's word is. So they suffered persecution. I will read from uh, Eusebius, who was a very famous historian. Again, if you are a history lover, you would have heard of him. This is not Eusebius, the Portuguese football player. This is a historian. He says, this is about persecution. He says, even the wild beasts refused at last to attack the Christians. The bloody swords became dull and shattered. 
the executioners grew weary. But the Christians went singing to their deaths with hymns of praise, thanksgiving and worship on their lips. Many were martyred. Remember, some of you remember uh, Vibia Perpetua, that girl from North Africa, I told you that story, how she, her handmaiden or her servant, and four of the elders of her church were martyred in the city of Carthage. She was given many opportunities to recant her faith and to worship Caesar. At that time, Caesar worship was very important. Her answer was, if he be God and died for me, no sacrifice too great can be. In fact, those words are captured in a famous Christian hymn of the 19th century. If he be God and died for me, no sacrifice too great can be. So that was the Smyrna age. Then we go to the next Pergamon, 312 to uh, AD 590. Pergamon was the faltering church, the patronized church. Something happened in world history that completely changed the course of the Christian church. What happened was, there was a man by the name of a general by the name of Constantine and he was leading a Roman campaign in Britain. At that time, the emperor had died and the message reached him that somebody was trying to usurp the throne and there was no clear succession plan for the emperor. So, Constantine wanted the Roman Empire. So he came rushing back with his troops and he met with his usurper in battle. It's known as the Battle of the Malvian Bridge. There, before he went into battle, he apparently saw a vision. Of course, it was in Latin, but in English it meant, in this sign you will conquer. And it was the cross. And he took it as a sign that God was with him. And that's a story. Most likely it's a legend. But Constantine became a Christian. And he forced Christianity upon his empire. Means everyone had to now become Christians. So what really happened was, those who were persecuted and growing in the faith now became comfortable. And someone said those who walked with bare feet were now wearing comfortable slippers. Those who slept on bare floors are now sleeping on comfortable mattresses. That's what the historian said. So the church, instead of being persecuted, is now being embraced by the Roman Empire. And this is what happened. So this is known as the over-tolerant church or the faltering church. And chapter 2 verse 14, God speaks to them about the teaching of Balaam. If you have studied the, the book of Numbers, you will know. Balaam was asked to curse the people of God. His curses were not working because God was protecting his people. So you know what he did? If you can't beat them, join them. If you can't beat them, corrupt them. So he corrupted the people. Balaam got uh, the children of Israel, the men, to marry ungodly Gentile uh, Moab, uh, Moabites or Moabite women. And that's, where, that's how they went into idolatry and they corrupted their faith. So here, the, the devil tried to attack the church. Remember, during the Smyrna age, there was a leader in the 3rd century, early 3rd century called Tertullian. He said, in the blood of the martyrs lies the seed of the church. So when people were being martyred, the church was growing. Now, Satan found out that he could not eliminate the church. So what did he do? He made it comfortable. So, once Rome embraced Christianity, that was particularly the downfall of Christianity at that stage. So, that is Pergamum. Then comes what we call as the Dark Ages, the false church. Thyatira was the false church. Writing to them, the Lord introduces himself. And these are the words of the Son of God whose eyes are like blazing fire and his feet like burnished bronze. Why? He is coming to battle against that church, primarily because that church is the worst in the church age. And this is running for almost a thousand years, AD 590 to AD 1517 until the Reformation. And interestingly, he calls this chapter 2 verse 20, you tolerate that woman Jezebel. I've already mentioned Jezebel once before in this as an illustration. Jezebel was married to Ahab who was one of the weakest and the worst kings Israel ever had. She dominated Israel and she also gave his daughter in marriage to the king of Judah in order to uh, you know, kill Judah as well. 
because she was an idolater and she was a, a wicked woman who didn't believe in the God of Israel. And uh, so this was the compromising church. In fact, a vast majority of false teaching came into the body of Christ during this period. I know some of you are from a certain background, you know, faith background. It's not a personal attack on anybody, but a lot of these teachings, example, the purgatory, which is not in the Bible. It is actually from Babylonian religions and the Muslims believe in purgatory. You burn for your sins, pay for it, and then go to paradise. There is no such thing in the Bible. For it is today is the day of salvation. For it is appointed unto men to die once and after that the judgment. Nothing can be done after a person dies. So giving alms to the poor in somebody else's memory doesn't work. Okay, if you love them in their memory you can give, but it's not going to help their destiny. And the, the whole concept of, the, of November 1st, you know, this All Souls Day came out of that concept. You pray for the souls of the dead. In fact, that has crept into certain other denominations, the Anglican denomination. Recently somebody died and this Anglican priest calls me and says, come there, can you pray for the soul of this lady who is dead? I went for the funeral, I didn't pray for that lady, I thanked for her life I, uh, because he was a believer and I prayed for the family. Once a person is dead, no amount of prayer or giving alms is going to help. But that's not biblical. So they have gone out of the scripture. Then the worship of mother and child which came from Semiramis and uh, from the old uh, Babylonian thing. You know, Nimrod and Semiramis. Nimrod was such an evil king, he married his own mother, Semiramis. God struck him dead, he died early. Semiramis introduced that concept of mother and son, both deity. The queen of heaven concept about Mary, totally unbiblical. There are no queens in heaven. There is only one God in three persons. And Mary, like each one of us we have seen, is a human being. And no human being can take a special place in heaven. Oh, it is reserved only for God. That's exactly what Satan wanted. Lot of those, salvation was being sold, sins were forgiven if you give money. Lots of this uh, idolatry came into the church. All of that has now continued into many of the denominations and we still have it today. So this was literally the Dark Ages. And in Europe, in history, it is known as the Dark Ages. And this lasted for a thousand years. So Thyatira was perhaps the worst of the church ages. Then, we move to the next one, Sardis. Now Sardis, the Lord introduces himself as these are the words of the one or him who holds the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. Now Sardis represents the Reformation church. The, the 1517, about three or four years ago, they celebrated the Reformation, but it eventually compromised with the kings and it became like the Roman church that it had replaced. So it became the sleeping church. So that is AD 1517 to AD 1750. You have a reputation of being alive, but you are dead. Interestingly, if you go to Sardis today, there are two parts, the lower city and the upper city. The upper city is a bit like our Sigiriya, right on top of a big mound of earth. It looks solid. Now, Sigri, as you know, is solid because it's rock. Now, this also actually looks solid, like a solid rock. But in fact, it's only hardened clay. It can collapse any moment. That's why today, they don't allow pilgrims or tourists to go up there. You can see it from a distance. From another hill, you can see it because it is just hardened clay. So, the Protestant church was like that. The Lord says, you have a reputation of being alive, but you are dead. So even though the Reformation brought back salvation by grace through faith, the, Re the Reformation Church or the Protestant Church also compromised with the world. Again, a dark age for the Christians. Now comes one of the good churches, Philadelphia. The Lord says, these are the words of him who is holy and true, who holds the key of David. What do you do with the key? You open doors. So this is the church of the open door. This is the famous missionary movement, the church with opportunity. So that goes from 1750 to 1925. The Lord speaks to them about an open door. The doors I open, no one can shut, he says. The doors I shut, no one can open. That's a promise of God to Philadelphia. Now, in some ways, we have to be grateful because 
of those missionaries who came with the gospel to this land. So, like, take my life, for example, my ancestors were touched by the lives of the missionaries, and uh, I went to a missionary school, and uh, that's what laid the foundations for my life. And it's the same with many of us. And uh, if you didn't know a little bit of uh, trivia, Sri Lankan history, in the, the late 19, uh, sorry, late 18th century, you remember 1796, the British captured the maritime provinces from the Dutch. So the first governor was Frederick North. So at that time, some American missionaries came down to Sri Lanka, and uh, Frederick North was very suspicious of them because this was a few years after the American War of Independence, about 20, 30 years. So they hated the Americans at that time. Around that time only, if you remember, they went and burnt the White House. So the White House that is there now is a different White House. So the uh, Frederick North didn't want those missionaries anywhere. As punishment, he sent them off to the North and East. Where those days, there was the Vani area and down to Polonar, that area was thick jungles, infested with wild animals and in addition to that, with robbers and uh, things like that. It was very dangerous. So he said, okay, you want to serve here, you go to the North and East. And that's how the earlier schools were formed in the North and East. My school is going to be 200 years old in just two years' time. So that's a bit of history. But how did the missionaries go? They used their brains. They didn't go through the jungles. Very dangerous. They took a boat and went past Mana, Putlam Mana that way, and they went to the north. East, they took a boat, round past Hamman Tota that way, and they went to the east. So th that's a bit of trivia. So the missionaries, came with the gospel. And you know what's happening now? Now we are sending missionaries to other parts of the world. There is one organization that I'm involved in, some of you may know about that, uh, Global Impact. Global Impact is sending missionaries. We have sent missionaries to a convention, to a Muslim majority country close by. We send missionaries to uh, Bihar in India, to Bangladesh, to another part, a place called Minikoi in India. So. We are all missionaries in some ways, and we are sending missionaries. A good friend of mine who worked with me, and I know him well, some of you know him, Hans Bavert, he's a missionary in East Timor. Assemblies of God have sent him. So the missionary movement started during that time, and they touched the lives of everyone. In some way, every single one of us are touched by what happened during the missionary movement. So names like David Livingston, uh, who went to Africa, Adoniram Judson, who went to Burma, and uh, so many names. Uh, then Hudson Taylor, who went to China. Then D.L. Moody, Charles Wesley. These are the people. Henry Martin. These are the people who really affected the lives of people. A little bit of story about Henry Martin. Henry Martin was, uh, I may have shared this before, he was a very, very intelligent man. At the age of 12, he ended up in Cambridge University. I went to Cambridge at the age of 38. Not to study as a tourist. But uh, uh, I wasn't good enough, intelligent enough to go to Cambridge. I went to Sri Lanka Law College. Okay, right. so no, don't laugh. Okay, uh, but uh, but now Henry Martin went to University of Cambridge and he well maths, and that's one of the subjects that I'm terrible at. He was so brilliant, but he had one problem. He had warts. You know what these warts are? These things that grow all over his body, even on his face. So he was ugly to look at. So even uh, his biography says, even when he went to watch the, at the parks where the Oxford and Cambridge play the annual cricket match, he loved cricket, so, so there's something nice about him. He used to hide behind a tree and watch because he didn't want anyone to see him. He was always, he always wore full sleeves, gloves, only his face was exposed. But they say love is blind. When I look around, I can see that. Okay, uh, love is blind. Uh, that's why your spouse married you. Now, uh, there was one woman who fell in love with him in spite of his uh, physical ugliness. She fell in love with his brain. So he was about to marry her when the call of God came to him to go to India as a missionary. He went to his beloved and said, let's get married and go to India. She told him, I'll, for some reason she didn't like India. She said, uh, like Stephen Smith, I suppose. He said, I, I will go to any part of the world with you, but not to India. He goes back to the Lord and says, Lord, she's refusing to come. The Lord says, no, it's India. He goes back to her. She says, no, any place but India. So he gave her up because knowing that with this physical condition, he'll never find true love. Nobody will marry him. He sacrificed 
and he came to India. They brought him to the western side of India, Maharashtra near Mumbai, and uh, they put him down on the coral reef, and he had to swim the rest of the way to India. So as, he, as they put him down on the coral reef, Henry Martin went on his knees, and he said, Lord, here let me burn out for you. Those are his famous words. And then he went into India, he moved to Afghanistan and Persia, finally, uh, sorry, in the meantime, he translated the New Testament into Hindustan or Hindu, into uh, Pashtun, you know, one of the leading African languages, and also into Persian. Finally, the Shah of Persia got him killed, and the punishment was, he was tied, his feet were tied and hands were tied, and he was tied to a horse and released in the wilderness. The horse dragged him through the wilderness, and he suffered and died for the Lord. All this by the age of 33. And a famous man of God had a small uh, autograph given by Henry Martin. And this is what Henry Martin said. Time is short. Make maximum use of your life. So he is just one of the people who touched the world during that open door period. The church, the practical church, the Philadelphia church. Remember, it, it was a weak church, but a powerful church in the Lord. And they took the gospel out. Now we come to the last and the final church, Laodicea, and that is the age in which we are living. These are the words of the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the ruler of God's creation. So Laodicean age is the present day church from about 1925 to until the rapture. We, we believe it will take place any time. Now Laodicea is called lukewarm. Now I'll tell you why it is lukewarm. I keep forgetting one city, though I visited that place. Now there are uh, there are two uh, cities uh, next to uh, Laodicea. On the one side, Colosse, and the other one, um, mm -hmm. let it be X. Uh, I'll come back to you. Okay. There were two cities. Uh, one is Colosse, to whom a letter was written. Colosse had uh, chilled iced water because of some geological thing. So their water was very cold, like cool water. Then the other city, which today is a major tourist attraction, they have hot springs. I've even got into those hot springs, like a bit like the one in Trincomalee, but of course much bigger. So very warm hot water on one side and very icy cold water in Colosse. You know where Laodicea was, right in the middle. So these two springs of water came and met in Laodicea. So what did you get? Lukewarm water. That's why God is using that illustration to show their spiritual quality. Their spiritual life was lukewarm. And if you may, if I can just remind us of what I read, let me read that again. You say, I'm rich, I've acquired wealth and do not need a thing, but you do not realize that you're wretched, pitiful, blind, poor and naked. The church has never been as rich as this before. Only yesterday there was a news item, one of these so-called famous prophetic people has been raided, house has been raided by the police in a particular country and he has billions and billions of uh, uh, wealth that he's, it's unaccounted for. A preacher of God's word who lives only from the contributions of God's people has billions of pounds or dollars or whatever the currency unaccounted for. So now they will file a case against him, primarily because it is it amounts to money laundering and lack of uh, not paying taxes. So not Sri Lanka, some other country. Now that shows us today. Uh, some of them have five or six private jets. Some of them have mansions that are worth millions of dollars. And uh, this is shown as today's Christianity especially the word of faith movement, all of them, I'll say it before in the presence of the Lord, are charlatans because they represent the Laodicean church. Utterly lukewarm, the Lord says in this spit, you know the original Greek word means to put out with a lot of violence or a lot of force, like we call it vomit. The Lord is basically saying, you are so nauseating, the so-called church in the 21st century is so nauseating that I want to vomit you. You know why the body vomits things? If the body feels that there is something that doesn't agree with you, it tries to get rid of it. And you have no control over, you know, when you throw something out. 
That's what the Lord says. I want to spew you out. I want to, you know, vomit you out because you are so horrible. So that's the age that we are living in. Now, I'm sure most of you have not heard it. Have you heard of a guy called Visarian? Not Visarian. Visarian in the is man. Visarian. No, because it's latest news. Okay. Visarian was a traffic policeman in Russia a few years ago. Today, he is one of those false Christs. Let me read it for you. The city of the sun is home to a mysterious Russian cult known as the Church of the Last Testament. His leader, Visarian, used to be a traffic cop, but now believes that he is the second coming of Jesus Christ. And uh, why are they arresting him? The police have arrested him for embezzling funds from his followers. Money? It's all about money. All false prophets, it's all about money. And physically and mentally abusing his followers. But if the Lord said, many will come claiming that he is Christ. So he is claiming. But Christ is not going to come and stay somewhere in Russia. When he comes, he will come visibly. Revelation chapter 19. So that brings us to the end of the last church. So we are here. Right now. Somewhere there. So end of chapter 3 in Revelation, you find the rapture. Why do I say the rapture happens at the end of verse three, uh, chapter 3? Three? Chapter 3 ends the church age. Uh, from chapter 4 onwards, there is no mention of the church here on earth. Church is no longer mentioned here. Church is mentioned up there. So the rapture happens at chapter 3, end of chapter 3. Chapter 4 begins the events for the tribulation. So God willing, Tomorrow, uh, sorry, next Sunday, we'll start looking at chapter 4 onwards. We are going to look at the tribulation. Tribulation will take us almost one and a half uh, sermons. Yeah, it's a lot to study there. Okay. Let us pray. Father, thank you and praise you once again for what you have taught us. Thank you, Lord, for encouraging us and edifying us. Lord, we know that we are living in a, an age of Laodicea where the church thinks that it's alive and active and rich. But the Bible says that it is blind and pitiful and poor. Lord, help us to become rich in spiritual things. Help us to serve the Lord Jesus because we love him. Lord, we know that time is short. Inspire us, Father, like the way you inspired the likes of Henry Martin. In Jesus' name. Amen.